Yeah, I'm already sharing the screen. I think that everything is fine, right? Um, so yeah, and um, Sam, as you mentioned, of us will have so many great events coming up. And also I'm super excited about new updates in top 10. I would like to emphasize cryptography that uh, cryptographic failures now is top two. So yay. <laughs> Uh, so if you understand that you struggle with cryptography, um, just just for you know, I'm working in a company that does a lot of cryptography related software and tools. And tonight our, uh, our topic for the talk is gonna is also related to cryptography. So let's get started. I'll try to do it um, fast and interesting. And if you don't have any like cryptographic background, no worries, you won't go deep inside ciphers, no math. So just relax and enjoy. Um, as we mentioned, cryptographic protection of machine learning models. Yeah, my name is Nastasi. My nickname is Vixentail and I'm a security software engineer. I do a lot of things related with data security, with cryptography, applied cryptography. I say applied cryptography, meaning that I am not the one who will design new ciphers, well, at least not now, maybe later, but I'm the one who definitely implements the cryptographic layer in the software, right? Design some end to encryption uh, protocols or just make sure that cryptography is well implemented. And tonight we're going to talk about a hype topic uh, ML and security. Unfortunately, as is a hype topic, there are a lot of different connected issues. So this is the list about things we won't cover today. We won't talk about adversarial networks. We won't talk about, you know, all these shiny holographic stickers that you can put on a stop sign for, uh, for automated car to recognize this stop sign as different sign. We won't talk about that. We won't talk about machine learning, like unlearning mechanism, which is really interesting. So I encourage you to check out the links after my talk. We also won't talk about malware inside machine learning networks. Sorry, topic for another day. Also sounds exciting. And of course, we won't talk about TensorFlow bugs. They have a lot of bugs. And recently another one was discovered related with um, YAML format, serialization, deserialization. Not today. Today we're going to talk about a little bit about TensorFlow. Again, if you don't have experience in machine learning, no worries. I am also not a machine learning engineer. We're going to have, we're going to talk about like security from, you know, more like high level perspective. We're going to talk about a lot about cryptography, um, how to construct the encryption layer. And we're going to talk about different, you know, traditional security controls, like integrating cryptography uh, into existing security controls or building security controls around cryptography, like API protection, like um, cloud storage protection, mobile application protection, anti, like, like reverse engineering protection, things like that, because cryptography doesn't uh, live in a vacuum. And every time when you need some ciphers, when you need some crypto, you need to understand that it's a real life and um, just cryptography is not enough. So let's dig in. Basically, a case that I will explain tonight, it's, I cannot say that it's real life because I should not say that, but it might have, it might have happened. Um, and imagine that there were, there were companies that had uh, machine learning techniques um, in their mobile applications. So they have pretty popular mobile applications for iOS and Android. And they used a lot of um, machine learning to do something for their users. Let's let's say let's let's just say theoretically they uh, ask users to submit their photos and then they use machine learning to put like get eye get ears on on user pictures you know things like that right so the talk today is going to be uh, about protecting those machine learning models because that company changed their data flow previously they were using like classic backend processing. Right, so mobile applications send these pictures to the backend, and backend had a huge machine learning model that was doing all required computation and then sent results back as a picture to mobile applications. Right, so all IP, all machine learning related things were happening on the backend side. But then this company decided to change this flow because obviously um, cloud. Uh, 
processing uh, cloud, cloud processing bills were <laughs> increasing as when the when they have more and more and more users and they wanted to you know to offload some resources from cloud side and put those resources to mobile applications so the new suggested flow was let mobile application send the picture backend would prepare individual machine learning models that i will call tonight iml and send this individual machine learning model back to the client side back to the application side then application itself would run uh, machine learning processing and application itself would put those cat ears on people's faces right so instead of having one huge machine learning model on the back end this approach allows to have smaller individual machine learning models on mobile applications and as both ios and android support tensorflow that sounds like a good deal however security questions arise what are the risks of the decision as this talk tonight that's mostly cryptographic talk i won't go deeply inside threat modeling but just you know to give you like um, from bird's eye view the most important business risks were losing those individual machine learning models because one small individual machine learning itself it's not an issue they're highly customized per user right but if someone if some attacker decided to collect many machine learning models they could theoretically uh, understand how technology worked and uh, recreate this huge original machine learning model you know what i mean so what we are protecting here is the small individual machine learning model that backend now sends to millions and millions of users and mobile devices. Obviously, analysis of this, like the most important risk here, obviously, and other risks include abuse of infrastructure, um, meaning that someone can create a script to ask for many, many of these models, you know, do some kind of um denial try to do some kind of denial of service of the backend asking again for more and more models of these models which will lead to obviously um, losing revenue uh, potentially reputational risk yada 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 but the main idea was that the company should not uh the company tried to avoid leaking many of those individual machine learning models Let's talk about technology a little bit. Uh, what we have here is native mobile applications, iOS and Android, Ma native meaning that languages used for Swift and Objective-C for iOS and Kotlin for Android. And of course, the machine learning frameworks, which is CodeML on iOS and TensorFlow Lite on Android. From the backend perspective, the, the case has Python backend, TensorFlow and um, any cloud. In our example, I use Google Cloud Platform, right? So uh, workers, storage, KMS, Firebase, databases, everything in Google Cloud Platform. And this is how the simplified data flow look like. As we are not interested in protecting all the things, right? Let's have a focus here. We are interested only in protecting individual machine learning models. And this is on the scheme, we see the, um, the data flow, the life cycle of the model. So the models are generated on the backend in Google Cloud, like in a server on a worker side, right? Based on some user input, based on some user data. Then these models um, are being stored on Google Cloud Platform storage. And then mobile applications through API can gather those models and put them on the mobile side. The thing, the important thing here is um, all this is happening in real time and all this is happening per request. Like so, right, so user presses a button, application, the mobile application makes a request to the backend, backend calculates this individual machine learning model, stores it at, at, the, file, uh, at the Google Cloud Platform storage and API, uh, response back to the mobile application, the URL, the link to the model. And of course, when we have these individual machine learning models like separated, like, you know, stored in the infrastructure like that, we can build the life cycle and we can analyze where, where, what are the risks, what are the threats, 
where is this machine learning model? What is data flow? What parts of what components of the system it goes through? Right, as we mentioned, uh, it was generated on, on the worker side, on the server side. So obviously, it it's appeared in the memory of the worker. Then it goes it goes through a transit to the storage. Again, it appears on the storage. Right then, it goes through the API, and at last, it comes to the mobile application. So we have basically we have all the possible options here, all all the things at once. Uh, storing in memory, storing in transit, storing on the storage, and this model just appears almost everywhere. Um, from a threat modeling perspective, again, this very simplifies threat modeling. We say that as our model appears almost everywhere, there are different kind of threat vectors, right? For example, leakage through API, leakage through storage. Imagine that model lives there forever, won't be good. Right, um, leakage through eavesdropping, and of course, insecure uh, storage on mobile application. Imagine when your application is so popular that it has millions and loads, literally, uh, that someone would, will decide to crowdsource um, the models, right? That some competitors will ask your users to gather these models and send to competitors. So we don't want that, definitely. We want to protect the model on both side as well, and we don't trust users like at all. Uh, in terms of stride uh, threat modeling, we are mostly interested in spoofing, tampering, disclosure, and denial of service, which means that protection methods that we kind of have um, is to uh, is to make sure that data um, authenticity, uh, integrity, and confidentiality won't be touched. Right, availability. Mm, I mean, cryptography won't help with availability too much, but it can, it can definitely help with CR3R. So let's use cryptography because, as we mentioned previously, our individual machine learning models are stored everywhere. The data flow looks huge, and it's going to be really good to have super nice security control that we can use once the model is generated and until the model is executed. But before we, before we dig in into cryptographic part, let's talk about what is machine learning model. What kind of thing we are trying to protect here? Disclaimer: I am not an ML engineer. Okay, uh, so from my very naive look, machine learning models in our example they are just files. I mean, yeah, they were specialized files. Yeah. In this example, they had layers, and every layer, uh, every layer had weights, like like numbers, right? Weights. But from security perspective, it's still just file. Everything is simple when we're trying to protect files. So, how to build the encryption layer? As we mentioned previously, that machine learning models are being generated on the backend side. The obvious solution is to encrypt them right before generation. So trying to, to decrease the um, lifetime of plain text model, encrypt them on the generation side, store them encrypted all the way until you put this model to the mobile application side and then decrypt them on the mobile application side. So encrypt one, once, decrypt once, right? Looks like a symmetric scheme to me. And indeed, Let's take a look on the requirements, how we would for formulate the requirements for this encryption layer. First one is obvious. Let's try to minimize the lifetime of plain text individual machine learning model file. We want to store it in plain text as like tiny amount of time as possible. Then let's try to minimize the chance of someone accumulating these models, which means that which mean that it would be nice if every model would be encrypted using different kind of keys, because then brute forcing those keys would be pretty long, right? And of course, as we're talking about mobile applications and as we're talking about Python backend, it would be really nice to have fast, smooth cryptography, industrial proven cryptography. So yeah, in this, in our example, we're gonna use just IS, GCM, and the elliptic of Diffie-Hellman for key exchange. No fancy things, no Blake, no Argon. 
very industrial proven, very traditional cryptographic ciphers. Um, and number four, it would be really nice, imagine the amount of these models, imagine the amount of mobile application. It would be really nice to live without public infrastructure. What I mean is that when you have so many users, when you have such large load, the good idea would be not to store public keys of everyone, you know, because good PKI is a very expensive PKI, building public infrastructure is really expensive, long and complicated journey. And sometimes if we could avoid it, this is a good thing from cryptography perspective. Not the best from maybe from security risk perspective, but in our case, using ephemeral keys, ephemeral means temporal, using temporal encryption keys, avoiding building a complicated PKI was a good choice. And obviously all these things should work on the platforms that we selected. And it's gonna be, it might be tricky with cryptography because often when developers try to use cryptographies, they use their like native language, native library available in the language they're using right now. And sometimes when they realize that thing that they encrypted on one platform should be encrypted on another platform. And cryptographic libraries often have quite incompatible APIs to solve that, fortunately, good libraries exist. And we used one of them, Temis. Uh, it's also possible, I will, I will show an example later, it's also possible to use Lipsodium, basically use multi-platform cryptographic libraries, libraries that are built for your target platforms. Let's take a look about cryptography a little bit deeper. So in our example, remember, we have a backend that will encrypt machine learning model, and we have mobile applications that will decrypt machine learning model. To do that, and we use individual keys for each model. To do that, um, we're gonna generate key pairs on each side. So mobile application will generate its key pair, and it will send its public key to the backend side. Backend side will generate its key pair as well. Then backend side will perform um, elliptical of Diffie Hellman and generate a shared key. Then back inside will generate random data encryption key, which is which I, we are calling DEC D E K data encryption key. Then back inside will encrypt the model using data encryption key using IRGCM. Then, right, so data so we got data encrypted, but so we still have a key. Then back inside will encrypt the encryption key using pre-generated uh, shared key, again using IRGCM. And then we have the, the package. We have encrypted model, encrypted key, and server public key. And this package is what was stored on the Google Cloud storage, and this package is what we sent back to the mobile application. On mobile application side, Mobile application takes its own uh, private key from previously generated key pair, right? It takes a server side public key from the response from this package. It uses the same, it does the same operation. It uses Elliptical of Diffie Hellman to generate shared key. Then it uses IRGCM decryption with shared key to decrypt data encryption key. And, and then it uses data encryption key. ILGCM to decrypt the model. Very simple, super straightforward. And the good idea that these um, keys are, are ephemeral. So this um, data encryption key, it was used once for only one model. Next model will use another data encryption key. For next exchange, both parties can generate another key pairs. You know what I mean. So. Um, the format of um, individual machine learning model, again, super straightforward. If we put it in the, into JSON, it would look something like that. By the way, this is just like a real JSON here. I mean, um, what, you, what you see here is a data field, which is our encrypted model, right? A key field, which is encrypted model key, public key, which means server side public key from key pair. And I call it ephemeral again to emphasize that this key can be changed on another generation. Of course, versioning is very important. When you use cryptography, when you encrypt something, please, please, please put a version there because soon 
like sooner or later, you would like to change your cryptographic cipher or you, your approach. And versioning will really help you here. So obviously we will put version and we might have even more encryption inside the layers of machine learning model, but just remember this thought, I will come back to it later. So technically when we're encrypting, let's, let's, get a, let's make a step back. When we're encrypting the machine learning model, we can do it as a file and we have encrypted the model. We use ephemeral key, we encrypted the key and everything is based on key exchange first. And this is how the code looks like. And this is Python code. And yeah, while it may look like a pseudocode, I think it's actually like real Python code. I think the thing is compilable, except probably the like last line. Um, and the reason why the amount of cryptographic code is so like low, so small, we have only, I don't know, like 12 lines here, right? The reason is because we're using library. Like we use, in this example, we use Tennis library, which is like boring crypto library, which has a um, very simple API. And as you can see, um, developers don't need to handle this huge amount of cryptographic code when they want only to encrypt the data. So in this uh, in this example, the, like uh, we generate a security pair with private key and public key, easy. Then we generate this ephemeral data encryption key, cool then we encrypt the model awesome using previously generated ephemeral encryption key we can make encryption even more uh, strong if we will if we pin this encryption to user entity and in this, in this example i put user id here which will which means that to decrypt to decrypt this model you need to know not only the key but the user id as well otherwise decryption will fail and then we use elliptical of the Harman to generate um, to generate shared key and to basically encrypt our data encryption key one more time, uh, to encrypt our data encryption key. And this is the package, and this is what we sent on, um, on the mobile application side. Mobile application code looks pretty much similar. And this one, you know, backend only, only encryption, right? So backend doesn't care about decryption. Obviously, on, um, in tests, developers obviously have tested that their code can be, <laughs> that results can be decrypted, but Technically, production code doesn't need any decryption side. Uh, mobile applications. In, in this example, iOS. This is an example of iOS code. And again, it can look like pseudocode, but it's a Swift, uh, more or less com compilable code. Uh, what, we, what is happening here? Pretty much the same. We generate a key pair for mobile application, private and public key. Then we use Elliptical of Diffie Hellman using server side public key. and mobile application own private key to generate um, shared key to decrypt encrypted data encryption key. Then we, and, uh, we decrypt the model, we decrypt the data. So how many? 10 lines of code, right? And we have the encryption layer built. I'm telling you, cryptography is easy when you use proper tools for that. We used a TAMIS. Uh, disclaimer, yeah, I'm one of the maintainers of TAMIS. Uh, but the library is free to use and open source, and basically this is one of the boring crypto libraries. Uh, Lipsodium is another example of boring crypto libraries. Tink, I think, can be named as another example of boring crypto libraries. Why we call them boring crypto libraries? Just because using them is very boring. I mean, look at that. No exciting cryptographic things here. Everything is super straightforward. No need to think about ciphers. No need to think about how large the key should be, how should I generate in its vector, what nonce, what padding. No need to think about all the things, just use API, call encrypt or decrypt, and you're good to go. Um, the idea is behind them is that this is the same code base and it has basically the same API across 14 platforms and languages right now. So yeah, it's just guaranteed to, to work, to be compatible across all these APIs. An example that uh, we use right now with all this approach, right? How we encrypted the model, how we decrypted the model, all this approach is called application level encryption. And this is, um, this is another buzzword 
and this is pretty novel buzzword. So if you hear it right now, uh, remember that because I expect more and more articles and conference talks and you know hype things are happening with this buzzword because application application uh, level encryption that's very straightforward. Application is responsible for encrypting the encryption date, right? Um, application level encryption obviously it works together with TLS. So all this encryption doesn't mean that you don't need TLS. No, you still do need TLS. But the idea is that you, that you encrypt the data when it should be encrypted. And you store it encrypted all the time. You put it in your database encrypted. If this data is suddenly being locked, you know, because everything can be suddenly locked, all right? The log will have encrypted data, no leakage. Database will have encrypted data. All the cache is going to have encrypted data. So you encrypt the data and you store it everywhere encrypted until the point you want to decrypt it. Super easy, super straightforward. Of course, of course, it comes with performance penalties. Of course, it comes with kind of limitations. And of course, um, for example, search. Uh, and of course, there are ways to overcome, overcome this limitation. But the example that we use right now, the approach that we use right now is known as application level encryption if you if application is client side it's known as client side client level encryption right if application is the backend like server it's server side level encryption proxy side level encryption gateway side level encryption whatever if it's happening um on the on the applications that are ends it's it's known as end-to-end -end encryption and often people say that end-to-end -end encryption means involving a human, but it might be not the case. It, it's not always the case. Let's, if you're interested in application level encryption, there is another link to large, large article. Another buzzword, another thing I want you to know, uh, the approach we used with this encrypting data with one key and then encrypting key with another key, this approach, it's also, it's not new, but now it has new uh, buzzword term, uh, HPKE, hybrid public encryption, meaning that, again, the scheme is not you. It just, uh, it just got the RFC. And right now, I believe there are like 12 drafts in this RFC. And if you're curious, take a look. Basically, this RFC tries to standardize uh, things that many security engineers and cryptographers are already doing. So the goal of RFC is to put the term um, HPKE and to uh, like to describe different approaches for this multi-layer encryption. Because right now the termolo uh, terminology is very different. You can hear the things like key wrapping. You can hear, um, yeah, key wrapping. I think it's one of them. And developed encryption is another of them. So yeah. Uh, I hope that maybe in a year or two, when I will say to people like, hey, we're using HPKE version one to one, everyone will understand what I mean and what exactly keys we used. But let's see. So yeah, if you're curious about all this multi-layer encryption happening, check out the, um, the RFCs, the draft of RFC, because it's explained different approaches. In our example, we used symmetric, symmetric, and elliptic of Diffie-Hellman. But it, all, it also can be used symmetric asymmetric, asymmetric asymmetric, so different mixed mixes are possible. Um, let's get back to our case. When we encrypted the models and decrypted the models, let's talk a little bit about key management because you know encryption is easy, key management is hard, right? In our example, key management was not so hard because we used very like late white approach. We generated ephemeral key pairs, we generated ephemeral keys, almost no need for PKI, almost no need for all these key management um, procedures described in NIST guidelines like generation, revocation, expiration. Uh, I don't remember, um, I don't remember all of them. So yeah, um, of, of course, with the ephemeral key pairs, the good thing is that we don't need PKI. The bad thing is that uh, authenticity problem can arise, right? Think about man in the middle. In this example, we don't sell, we don't, we don't solve this problem using cryptography. We solve this problem using different ways, like TLS pinning, like server attestation, things like that. 
uh, if you want to, so the improvement or like another flavor of the scheme would be to build PKI, basically to pin public keys of mobile applications and the backend. This will help to solve authenticity problems. This will help to understand from mobile application that, yeah, this is exactly our service side we are going, we were supposed to talk to. And of course, mobile applications are great to do a different kind of cryptographic computations because they have keychain and key store and like secure key storages, right? Um, and in some cases, those keys can be bind with biometrics. So all cool. But uh, as I previously mentioned, cryptography doesn't live in a vacuum, right? So obviously, the scheme alone is not enough. Let's make it a little bit more complicated, but of course, more, more and more exciting. Uh, first of all, what we want to do is to re-encrypt the models, meaning that when application received the model, this model was encrypted using server-side uh, private key, right? Uh, application doesn't want to store server-side public key. Application does want to re-encrypt the model using, again, IS, using some other key, just to unpin, just to, you know, unbind from backend keys, not to store backend keys. Yeah. As I mentioned previously, re-encrypting uh, the model on the um, on the mobile application side. Let's move. Bonus points if you use uh, different mobile application libraries and bind those encryption keys used in re-encrypting to biometrics. But it's sometimes not possible because you know biometrics authentication affects UX. So. Sometimes we don't want users to know what is happening, but it depends on the risk model. The second layer of our defense in depth. Take a look on this timeline, the timeline of individual machine learning model. So it starts from right to left. Yeah, it's a bit confusing. From right to left. It starts uh, with a backend worker that has generated our model. And this is small amount of time when the model is in plain text, right? Then this worker has encrypted the model. Awesome. The model is encrypted. It's been transferred. It's been stored. It's been transferred again. It's encrypted until it gets to the mobile application, which decrypts this model. And of course, we won't store decrypted data. What's the point? Mobile application re-encrypts this model. And still, the model needs to be in plain text before being executed. Right, so this execution bit, mm, it kind of ruins all, all beauty of our, um, of our flow. We tried so hard to have model encrypted as much time as possible, but still uh, the core ML and TensorFlow, those libraries uh, push us to use plain text models because they don't know how to deal with encrypted models. No one knows some custom years to, to encrypt those models. So if you are using CoreML on iOS side, how we can help with that? If you are using CoreML on iOS side, actually Apple have docs on different ways to encrypt uh, machine learning models in a way that CoreML will understand and decrypt this model before executing. This is option number one. Option number two is to create custom layers Right, so in our model file, we have layers and we create a custom layer with encrypted weights and decrypt those weights in a runtime when the model is being executed. You know, it's encrypted and then the, the layer inside the model is encrypted. Uh, this encryption will CPU, so it will affect CPU. Um, another approach is even more complicated to use custom shader functions to obfuscate weights before executing on the shader on the GPU side, right? So we need to go deeper. Think about that. Machine learning model file encrypted, layer encrypted, and then some field, some weights can be obfuscated. Unfortunately, I say obfuscated because GPUs, uh, GPU shaders on mobile applications, typically they are not 
powerful enough to handle uh, normal traditional encryption algorithms. So uh, we are talking about simple obfuscation, simple, simple kind of mathematical procedures that we can do with this weight on the GPU layer. Yeah, as I, as I put here as number one. Um, when we're talking about performance, typically is that can render machine can like process machine learning and can render machine learning model like um the result of machine learning model on the screen probably this device can run photography without it affecting user experience because isgcm has hardware support for for many years already and all these modern mobile devices have special chips to run ILGCM, so no issues here typically like modern cryptography especially traditional cryptography like is it's not um it won't cost you as much as you might expect it to cost it's it's very cheap it's very cheap it doesn't have like if you do of course, it, it can be complex. I mean, it can be slow, but it depends on, you know, programming skills. Uh, but mostly users even won't see the delay if you do everything correctly. Now, we just finished with encryption layer. It works fine. We have encrypted our models during the whole life cycle. But as I mentioned previously, cryptography doesn't live in a vacuum. So let's talk very, very quickly about are the different traditional security controls that we can put into our data flow, into our infrastructure to support our cryptographic layer and to create yet another defense in depth layering happening. So in this scheme, I put it very like roughly uh, for application sites. For example, we're talking about obviously all the application security, all the OWASP, uh, MS, VS things. And we are talking about uh, reverse engineering protection because our models are stored on the application side. We want to protect our applications from too curious users, right? On API side, on the backend side, obviously we have we should have all this authentication, API security, traditional application security, and it would be really nice to have some kind of anti fraud system, which means that. If user asks like too many questions, if user application uh, tries to generate too many individual machine learning models, this anti-fraud system can calculate like fraud level. I will I will say I will talk about this in, in two slides. And what else? On uh, on storage layer, obviously, when we store these models, we want to make sure that we won't store them forever. Right, and we want to make sure that access control lists are fine. I mean that these models are not publicly available because that would be unfortunate. Um, on worker sites, login, monitoring, traditional application security, all the nice things. So really, really quickly, cloud storage. As I mentioned previously, we want to make sure that we don't store our models forever. We can use TTL in the URL. Right, modern cloud storage um, services support them. AWS support supports TTL, and Google Cloud Platform supports TTL. Um, easy. Obviously, it would be nice to use some kind of authentication there, so a link is not accessible publicly. Right, it would be very nice to clean up our models, make sure that these models won't be part of our regular backups. Yada yada yada. Basically, treat them as sensitive data. Treat them as I don't know user passwords, you know. And you know, you probably know that OWASP uh, Web Security Testing Guide they have a special chapter related to AWS S3 because people often misconfigure uh, S3 buckets. So yeah, OWASP has a special like guidelines how to make sure that if you store something in the cloud in a public it it doesn't appear in a public bucket. Next, API protection. You know the drill. You know all this authentication um, things, limit throttling, firewalling, yada, yada, yada. I would like to, like, basically all the was ASVS, right? It has how many? <laughs> so, like, so, like, 150 different, um, different security requirements. No need for me to, to talk about all of them. 
I just want to talk a little bit about anti-fraud system. The thing that I mentioned previously is that it would be really nice not to uh, send, even not to generate individual machine learning model for users that are known to be malicious. You know, how we can understand that users are malicious. We can grab uh, different kinds of events. Some events can be generated by mobile applications. Uh, some events can be generated by backend. And based on these events, our anti-fraud system can calculate scoring. If user is good enough, if user is suspicious, or if we believe that user is malicious. And depending on the scoring, we can, uh, like on a backend side, uh, we can change the behavior and, of our system. Obvious idea is not to send, not to generate machine learning, individual machine learning models to users that we believe are malicious, right? To limit sending these models to the users that we believe are suspicious. So we cannot know for sure. We can limit like five models per, per hour or any, any other metrics that works for the system. And if user behavior is okay, all good. What kind of events are we talking about? Typically, you know, Typically, we can uh, divide those events to stop factors and rules. Stop factors meaning that if event has happened, that's the end. That's, uh, that means that user is malicious, obviously, like 100%, like 99.9% chance that the user is malicious. For example, um, uh, the list of events will, differ, will be different in every system, right? So when I say you that, when we detect jailbroken device or rooted Android device, we believe that user is malicious. This can be true for your system or it can be false for a system. So list of events and reaction depends really on your system, on your risks and threats and like security guarantees you want to provide your users. But for example, things like invalid application signature or like failed um, device attestation, these events can be pretty good indicators that something fishy going on. Maybe that's not the normal, like normal user, you know. Uh, maybe this is some curious attacker trying to understand how application works. At the same time, with some events, we cannot be so sure. For example, application reinstall. Yeah, no, like normal users can reinstall applications several times. Where is the limit, right? So what we can do, we can calculate. Uh, how many times the application was reinstalled during some uh, time frame, and depending on our system again, put some limits there. So what I'm trying to tell here is that in this example, um, cryptography is used to protect the models itself, right? But the good idea is to prevent sending models to users that we believe are malicious, so they don't even have a chance trying to, the brute force, trying to break our cryptography. Um, another approach here, as we're talking about mobile applications, is remote device attestation. You probably know that Apple have um, Apple device check framework and Android has Android safety net framework. Most of them, they're different, but the idea is the same pretty much. Um, when application starts, Apple or Google can tell you with some guarantee that application was installed from original like App Store or from Play Market. Uh, and if application was modified, I mean, in terms of developer signature and the application sends that request to your backend and then you use your data to analyze, do you trust this application or not? Obviously remote dev device attestation can be abused, right? So it's, it's not like single tool that we can rely on, but it exists and these frameworks exist and they are very useful when you deal with a lot of fraud and when you deal with a lot of um, cloned applications, you know, like typical fraud when your application gets cloned, just changing some colors using pretty much the same name. And my, <laughs> my favorite as when they clone application, but still use your backend as a processing power, the best of or best of the best. I mentioned reverse engineering, and I just want to make a link to OWASP, MSVS, reverse engineering chapter. I won't dig into details. If you're curious about reverse engineering and anti 
reverse engineering things, just check out OWASP, MSAS, and MSG to find the security requirements and to find the um, like advice that you can do to protect your applications against reverse engineering. And um, last remark from machine learning perspective is that is that machine learning models, yes, they're files, but they're special files. So we can we can improve security of these models using machine learning approaches like watermarks, like custom layers, like things that are built into this model. Or we can even make these models very specialized that will work only in our like system, right? Only for our use case. So still in those models and trying to uh, use them for other like for other systems would be complicated as they can be binded. I won't go here into many details because I'm not a machine learning engineer, but I've learned so many nice things about machine learning when I was doing this project. So yeah, just to wrap up, uh, cryptography doesn't live in a vacuum. When you use cryptography, you should remember about all the shiny um, traditional security approaches and techniques to use. Um, to support cryptographic layer. And you know all of them, application security, API security, storage security, and reverse engineering, yada, 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 yada. Defense in depth, a lot of layers. We try to protect our precious as much as we can. Um, and yeah, just to finalize, I really like this a quote from Building Secure and Resilient Systems that, any security control, when you build a system and you design a system, you understand that any security control will be broken, right? It's a question of time, it's a question of uh, zero days, it's a question of implementation mistakes, yada, yada, yada. Any security control alone will be broken. So your goal is to build a system that has many security controls, that has a design that is resilient. So yeah. Uh, if you're curious about more about cryptography and um, how it can be combined with uh, software, things like application level encryption, things like cryptographically uh, signed audit logs, things like um, how to build React Native applications better, check out these links. You will get the slides, you will be able to tap on the links. And let me finish with that. If you're interested in, like, you can follow me on Twitter on LinkedIn. I share a lot of things about like, cryptography related, very applied, very pragmatic cryptography related things. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a fantastic talk, uh, Anastasia. We um, do have a few questions. Um, already uh, um, asked on um, uh, Slido and on YouTube. Um, I believe I copied them, but uh, everyone, if you would like to ask more questions, can you please use the um, uh, YouTube Q&A and uh, slido.do slash OWASP link in order to ask questions. I'll read out the questions to you. The question number one was, can you please talk about cell seal method in your sample code? What exactly does it do? Yeah, let me reshare the screen again. Uh, so if you're familiar, thank you for your question. If you're familiar with Lipsodium, you probably know uh, SecureBox. Temis has the same idea. Basically, Temis and Lipsodium are, have similar age, right? So the similar ideas behind the libraries. So Temis has the similar ideas, secure cell. Uh, and it means that uh, this is like an, um, an object, <laughs> an abstraction. Uh, that uses IES DCM inside uh, that allows you to symmetrically encrypt something that you put there using the key that you put there. Very similar to SecureBox uh, in Lipsodium, as I previously mentioned. Uh, so basically what is happening in these two lines of code, we create a secure cell and under the hood, it, uh, it uses IES DCM. Temis is built up uh, above OpenSSL, depending on your system, open cell, Libra SSL, like whatever So, So under the hood, it uses open SSL, it creates like, um, it's ready to encrypt data 
with the key you provided. And uh, the beauty of TAM is that even if you provide it, in this example, we use a key, but TAM is also supports past phrase interface. So you can put past phrases directly from users because under the hood, Tamis will use KDF key derivation function to create a strong cryptographic key based on the input. So in this line, we basically we prepare a uh, cryptographic primitive with the key. And on the next line, we put encrypted data there and we put some context. You know, uh, IRDCM is AED, um, authenticated encryption with additional data. Right, so it can use a uh, context and can use something that you provide during encryption and then during decryption as additional protection. And also IRGCM is interesting enough because it has this integrity check, right? So basically our tag, uh, which is used on decryption to make sure that the data was not tempered. So as a result, you have some encrypted container in Lipsodium, the same. You have some encrypted containers that consist of encrypted data and the stack, and you then decrypt these things. Uh, in terms of examples, the, the salt, the init vectors, all the all the things important, they are part of this container. So as developer, you don't need to think about them at all. Excellent. I think, this, yeah. This, yeah, answer. I think we have another question, which is, you can answer quickly. Someone is asking, what programming languages are supported by the Timis library? Well, there's 14 of them. <laughs> if you want me to start counting, I will do. So basically, oh, ex um, I, excellent. You had a slide, right? So yeah, we can see it there. Yeah. So it's, uh, Swift, Android, yeah, yeah. Java, Kotlin, uh, C, C++, quite a lot, uh, including Python, Ruby, Go, Rust. Uh, oh, fantastic. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. The um, thing is that uh, like language and a platform is a little bit different things, right? When we say JavaScript is a language, but not JS and WebAssembly are different platforms. So in terms is I'm struggling with calculated with calculating like languages because sometimes they have platforms. Excellent. I think that uh, slide covers it all. Next question is how long did it take to implement this solution? Uh, from the developer perspective, I don't know, like two days probably, because you see the amount of code. Uh, they just put these, uh, like from cryptography perspective, the cryptographic layer. Uh, I don't know how much time they used to basically from machine learning engineers to, you know, to separate the models. But cryptography was very easy. Uh, like two days, um, mobile developers implemented decryption part, backend developers incremented encryption part. They created some unit tests and they created some integration tests to make sure that things are working and things were working. So yeah, they just, and then they build them um, one API request. Okay, two, two API requests for key and then for data. That's a very simple, excellent, very straightforward. Excellent. So that's actually quite good, right? So it's uh, quite a quick um, uh, implementation for this library. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Designing, designing is a problem, right? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> there is another question on implementation. Someone is asking, do you have any data or figures regarding effect of this model on performance in context of acceptability to end users or cost of hardware? So uh, does it slow down their phones uh, to make them unusable? Uh, do you have any figures basically um, on the uh, performance impact? Yeah, I was trying to answer this question with this slide, basically. So uh, the mobile engineers on that side, they did a lot, a lot of tests and their verdict was that if um, device was good enough uh, to do core ML, to do the standard flow um, processing, and the result output had 50, 60 FPS, then device was good enough to do cryptography. So basically they limited um, the security control only on the strong enough devices but not because of the cryptography, mostly because of this client side machine learning rendering thing. So as I mentioned, cryptography was quite cheap. Here, what we are adding, we are adding extra requests and we are adding on each side, like extra layer of um, encryption decryption. That's all, it's not many things going on. If you use on the backend, if you use languages like Python or Ruby, Believe me, cryptography is not the performance bottleneck that you have. Excellent, thank you. And uh, I see one last question here. I'm not sure if there's more questions, please do ask. Uh, someone is asking, can you talk a bit more about the risks to the encryption decryption process if the phone is jailbroken? I remember you had a slide about 
jailbreaking that's probably yeah. related. Oh, what, yeah, what, 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 what are the risks there? Is there the risk to the keys being stolen, uh, storage? Can you talk a bit about jailbroken devices? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so everything you can imagine that happening on jailbroken devices can happen there, right? So if device is jailbroken, it means that the user, um, and this is a curious user, they have access to these decrypted, decrypted uh, individual machine learning models, and they have uh, access even to the processed memory, right? So the more defenses we build, the easier these defenses um, can be like mitigate, mitigated uh, on a jailbroken device. Right, and uh, the problem here in this particular use case, so jailbroken, jailbreaking, it's not always a problem, right? It really depends on your risks and threats. So in this case, the problem with jailbroken devices was that the application is extremely popular, millions downloads, and with this huge user base, they have uh, a real issue of broken applications and cloned applications. So many people tried to create a clone and many people were trying to um, like to create fake, like to create broken Android application and put it to FPDA portal for other users to download because this part of functionality was on the paywall, right? So they already had cases of users trying to abuse the system. So the goal of building um, defenses against reverse engineering was to first um, try to decrease amount of cloned application and broken application already exist and to make life uh, difficult for people who would like to steal those models. Think about crowdsourcing. Think about crowdsourcing on jailbreaking devices. I like this idea. And of course, all these things won't help against Pegasus. Yeah, so sorry. 